Here we go. All right. Welcome to session two of the Elijah Challenge training for reaching the unreached. I like to call this training for special forces kingdom of God. And this is in particular for missionaries who want a significant part in fulfilling the Great Commission during these last days. Now, if you'd like to have this PowerPoint presentation as long as well as the link for the videos which are being posted on YouTube, uh, please e email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Okay, just remember that Elijah003 at gmail. And uh, uh, in fact, I would like to give you this PowerPoint presentation because you can use it for review. Uh, it's packed full of materials, which I believe will be very useful to you. So um, yeah, please request this PowerPoint presentation, okay, if you don't have it already. Uh, by the way, uh, this PowerPoint is being upgraded almost every week, okay? So if you have received an earlier version of this PowerPoint, uh, go back to the same link and download the new version, okay? Uh, they are posted at the very same link that I gave you earlier. So if you want the very latest version, which, which will be the latest and the best, uh, just click on the link that I gave you earlier and you can download the very latest version. Now, let me tell you why the name of the ministry is the Elijah Challenge. It derives its name from Elijah's challenge to the 450 prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18.24. Uh, you recall at that time, nearly the entire nation of Israel had turned and worshiped a false god named Baal. Not everyone, of course, but many of them. And finally, uh, the Lord sent Elijah to, yes, for a power encounter at Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal. Okay, and Elijah said, uh, if the Lord is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. And the people said nothing because they were totally confused. They didn't know who the one true God was. And then Elijah issued his famous challenge. And this is what this ministry is named after. He said to the prophets of Baal, then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Um, just a second here. I'm just going to mute everyone. Okay. Now, this challenge is a very bold challenge. You pray to your God, and I'll pray to my God to do the miracle, and the God who does the miracle, he is God. It takes extreme boldness to issue this kind of confidence, excuse me, to issue this kind of challenge, all right? And you all know what happened, of course. Uh, the prophets of Baal, they, pre they prepared a sacrifice for Baal, and then they began to call on the name of Baal. For hours and hours and hours, they called upon his name, and Baal did not send fire. Finally, they gave up. And then Elijah stepped forward at the time of sacrifice, with the sacrifice he has prepared for the Lord. And he calls on the Lord to send a fire and God sent fire from heaven, which consumed the sacrifice and even licked up all the water in the trench. Only then did the Israelites fall prostrate and cry out the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Okay, this ministry is based on what Elijah did. We proclaim the kingdom of God with great power and great boldness. And not only that, with results, with miracles. Malachi 4, verse 5. The prophet says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Now, what does he refer to by that great and dreadful day of the Lord? He's referring to the coming of Jesus Christ, okay? And we believe we are in the very last days before the return of the Messiah. And according to this prophecy, the prophet Elijah will be sent before the coming of the Messiah. And I believe we are in those days in which God is fulfilling 
this prophecy, the extreme boldness and power of Elijah is being restored to us during these very last days. The very extreme boldness that Elijah demonstrated at Mount Carmel, and not only boldness, but manifest power, that is being restored to us during these very last days to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to proclaim the kingdom of God, to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah. The spirit and power and boldness of Elijah is being restored to us so that as we proclaim the kingdom of God, we will provide convincing evidence that Jesus is in fact the Messiah and that evidence will be miraculous healings and the casting out of demons. In Africa, well, I used to go there quite often. Every year I would go to Africa and on my mission trips, I would first train local disciples with the Elijah challenge. I would teach them how to heal the sick and cast out demons as evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the only way to the one true God. And following the training, we would have open air events during which we would invite the public to come to be miraculously healed and set free from demons. Now, during these open air events, yes, people would come and then I would proclaim the kingdom of God to them. I would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then toward the end of the preaching, I would speak to the witch doctors and I would challenge them. I would say, witch doctors, we have a lot of sick people who have come to be healed. I would invite you to come forward and use your magic, use your witchcraft to heal these people. And I wait and wait and wait for the witch doctors to come forward. They have never picked up the gauntlet. They never accepted the challenge. And so after that, then, I prayed to the Lord God and asked him to send to the fire of healing. After the prayer, then I asked the newly trained disciples to come forward. And then I asked all the sick people who have come to be healed to step to the front. And then I lead the newly trained disciples in laying hands on those who come forward to be healed. I lead them in laying hands on the sick and exercising the authority God has given us over diseases and demons. And within moments, people are being healed left and right. People come streaming up to the stage, testifying one by one by one by one that they have been healed in the name of Jesus Christ. They have been set free. The blind see, the deaf hear. After all the testimonies are over, then I continue my sharing with the people. I say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. He has shown, he has done these miracles because he loves you he wants you to repent and believe in the son jesus he is the one true god the evidence is the miracles that you have just seen now who wants to believe in jesus and people come streaming to the front accepting jesus christ as lord and savior repenting of their witchcraft this is typically what i did on my mission trips to africa so this extreme boldness this extreme power is being restored to us today to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah. Now, I am going to skip, I'm going to skip to slide one, three, four, and I will continue off from where we left last week. Now, the primary purpose and function of authority and power over disease and demons are demonstrating to the world through the miraculous that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Okay, that is the primary purpose of the supernatural authority and power that Jesus displayed in his ministry. And that is the primary purpose and function of the authority and power that Jesus has given to us to proclaim the kingdom of God. It's for demonstrating to the lost through miracles that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And as we studied last week, authority is exercised by issuing commands over diseases and demons. Because Jesus has placed them under our authority, the way we deal with them is by issuing commands to demons and diseases. And they must go because they are under our authority. Power, how is power exercised? Power is exercised by laying hands on the sick, through which healing power is transferred to the sick person. Now, so there is a difference between authority and power on the one hand and the gift of healing on the other hand. 
the gift of healing, as we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, gift of healing, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are primarily for building up the church, primarily to be used to minister to people in church, to born again believers. That's the primary purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including the gift of healing. But authority on power, by contrast, is primarily to be used when you are proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard, to those who are not saved, to Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and idol worshipers, and animists, and so forth. However, there can be significant overlap between authority and power on the one hand and the gifts of the Holy Spirit on the other hand. What I mean by that is the following. Authority and power can be used to minister healing to infirm believers, yes. And it is possible that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation during evangelism, during preaching the, the, during the preaching of the kingdom of God. So there can be overlap between the two. However, according to scripture, authority and power are primarily to be used during evangelism and preaching the gospel, while the gifts of the Holy Spirit are primarily used when ministering to sick believers, needy believers in the context of church. Let me share with you a testimony that I received just recently, okay? A higher caste woman possessed by a legion of demons was set free, and now she is witnessing boldly for Jesus Christ. Okay, this is from our website. For seven years, a young woman named Pernima had been possessed by a legion of demons. She became a terror to her parents by punching people, picking up things in the house and throwing them around and running off into the jungle. She and her husband lived around 50 kilometers from my hometown in Orissa and belonged to a high caste people group called the Yadav. Now, the one who wrote this is our India coordinator. Okay, I didn't write this. But our coordinator, whom we trained, was the one who sent this. Let me continue. To treat Purnima for her condition, hundreds of thousands of rupees, that's a lot of money for Indians, were spent on various sorcerers in different districts. But after going to all these districts, spending so much money, but with no change in Purnima, both were discouraged and at the end of their rope. Finally, through one of our believers, they heard about our Elijah Challenge ministry. On the last Sunday of January 2021, just last month, Pranima was brought to us. As soon as we began to minister to her, rebuking the demons with authority in Jesus' name, he did not pray to God for her, no, but he rebuked the demons directly. She began screaming at the top of her lungs. The horrible legion of demons left her and Purnima was set free. Both she and her grateful husband accepted Jesus Christ as their only Lord and Savior. She is now boldly witnessing for the Lord, telling others that Jesus is the only true God. He delivered me from an abhorrent legion of demons, she would say. Now, very recently... Purnima called us, meaning our India coordinator, to share about something most extraordinary. A month ago, a young man she knew had broken his lower back in an accident and had been taken to a local district hospital, but due to the severity of the injury, he was advised to go for more advanced treatment at the hospital in the city. Following treatment there, he was told to go home. He was to take prescription medication along with complete bed rest for three months. He was ordered not to stand up or even to sit up in bed. Okay, that's how serious his injury was. Then our brand new believer, Purnima, went to see him. Without saying a word, she laid her hand on him and commanded healing in the name of Jesus Christ, just as she had seen us doing when ministered to the sick. Astonishingly, within a few minutes, the young man sat up in bed. His mother, who was present, rushed to him 
and scolded him for disobeying the doctor's orders for a complete bed rest. No sitting, no standing. Pranima shared with her about how Jesus had delivered her from the legion of demons. The young man said that while Pranima ministered to him, he felt someone touch him and help him to sit up. Then he got up out of bed and began to walk around slowly. Pranima had accepted Jesus only a few weeks ago and actually knew very little about the Lord. She had known the Lord only less than three weeks, but God graciously used her. Soon she was sharing her testimony with many Hindus. Glory to God. This actually I received from our co-worker in India just today, this morning. This is the kind of things that missionaries can see overseas when they properly train local believers. John 14, 12 will be fulfilled. And what is John 14, 12? Those who believe in Jesus will do the works that he did. And here we see a brand new believer doing the works that he did. The key is proper training from the scriptures. Now, our task in the Elijah Challenge is to teach disciples to minister healing in this very context of proclaiming the gospel to the lost. In that very context. And that is the same context in which Jesus and his early disciples ministered. When Jesus and his disciples came 2,000 years ago, they were not ministering in churches. They were not praying for the sick in churches. They were not ministering to sick believers in churches. No, no, no. They came to save the lost. And that is why they performed so many miracles as evidence to the lost that Jesus was in fact the promised Messiah. And that is the context of this training. Therefore, when proclaiming the gospel to the lost, we should be ministering to the sick and demonized exactly as Jesus and his disciples did, which we are now studying in detail. It turns out that typical ministry in the church is not that biblical. All kinds of tradition are mixed in in the ministry that we see in the church with regard to ministering to the sick. Now, recall Luke 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power, supernatural power, and supernatural authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And of course, that includes COVID-19. Don't be afraid of it. Now, power, of course, is transferred through physical contact, through the laying on of hands. How is authority exercised? By issuing commands to those which are under our authority, which include all demons and diseases. Now, what was the purpose of Jesus giving them this supernatural power and authority? Verse 2, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. That was the purpose of this supernatural power and authority. It was for preaching the gospel to unbelievers and to those who never heard of Jesus. And to heal the sick. He didn't send them out to pray for the sick. No, no, no. He sent them out to heal the sick miraculously by using the supernatural power and authority he had given them. Verse 6. So they set out, meaning the 12 set out, and they went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. All right. Now, present day disciples and missionaries do not live up to what the early disciples did, even in the Gospels, not to mention what the disciples did in Acts. Today, missionaries today do not go from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Yeah, some may go from village to village preaching the gospel, but are they healing people everywhere? No, they are not. Present-day missionaries are not living up to what the early disciples did, let alone what they did in the book of Acts after the Holy Spirit came upon them. 
there is something terribly wrong with this picture. We need to wake up and see that what is happening in missions today does not resemble at all what we see in the book of Acts. There's something terribly wrong. We need to find out what is wrong and correct it so that what we see in the book of Acts will be duplicated today on the mission field and even greater. We need to see an acceleration in missions during these last days because there is so much work that remains to be done and so little time to do it. Now, notice that in Luke 9, Jesus gave the supernatural power and authority to the 12, and later the 12 were to be known as the apostles. Now, what about we disciples who are not apostles? Uh, do we receive any of the supernatural power and authority to cast out all demons and to cure diseases? Well, let's find out. Luke 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others. These were 70 other disciples who were not apostles. And he sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. All right. Now, did Jesus give to the 70 disciples any of this supernatural authority and power over demons and diseases when he sent them out? Or was it only for the big boys, for the 12, for the apostles to be? Well, what did Jesus send them to do? Did Jesus send them to, to feed the poor, to take care of orphans, and uh, to do good works, good humanitarian works, good social works, to show people the love of God? Is that what Jesus sent them to do? Let's find out. Verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Jesus sent out the 70 disciples who were not apostles to heal the sick and then proclaim the kingdom of God. If he had not given them any of the supernatural authority and power, he would have told them to pray to God for the sick. But no, he said heal the sick. So it's very clear that he also gave to the 70 this supernatural power and authority. Every disciple who is sent out is given a measure of this supernatural authority and power to heal the sick and cast out demons. Every disciple who is sent out is properly equipped to proclaim the kingdom of God effectively and fruitfully because they have been equipped with this weapon of supernatural authority and power to heal the sick, cast out demons effectively. And we are all sent out as witnesses of Jesus Christ, meaning every disciple has already been given a measure of this supernatural authority and power. Every disciple already has this authority and power, but many of them don't know they have it. And those who know that they have it, they have not been taught how to use it, how to pull the trigger and get the job done. My job is to teach present day disciples how to pull the trigger releasing supernatural authority and power to actually heal the sick and cast out demons. Now, let me address the question of God's will to heal or not to heal. Okay, this is a question. We think, well, if it's not God's will, then why should I bother to minister to this person? Because it's not God's will for this person to be healed. Okay, so it it could be a valid question. Okay, how do we deal with this question about God's will to heal or not to heal? Now, all right, when Jesus commands us to proclaim the kingdom in Luke, uh, in Luke 10, verse 9, when he commands us to proclaim the kingdom, is it God's will for the kingdom of God to be proclaimed to the lost? Of course, of course, if he commands us to do something, that means it's his will for whatever he commands us to do to be done. So when he commands us to proclaim the kingdom, that means it's his perfect will for the kingdom of God to be proclaimed to the lost. Is it God's will for you to proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost? When Jesus commands us to preach the gospel, is it God's will for us, for you to preach the gospel? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Yes. Now, in the same way, when Jesus 
commands us to heal the sick. When Jesus commands us to heal the sick, is it God's will for the sick to be healed when the kingdom of God is being proclaimed to the lost? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. He commands us to heal the sick. That means it's his will for the sick to be healed when we proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to the lost. Yes. See how obvious this is? Is it God's will for you to actually heal the sick? Not simply to try to heal the sick. No. When you are proclaiming the kingdom of God. Is it God's will for you to heal the sick when you are preaching the gospel? And the answer is yes. And notice, it's not God's will for you just to try to heal the best. To just do your best and if they're not healed, yeah, whatever. No. Heal the sick means get it done. He wants the sick healed as evidence that the kingdom of God has come near to them. You see that? So when you are out there proclaiming the kingdom of God, don't worry. Don't have any doubts about God's will to heal. God commands you to heal the sick. So he wants the sick to be healed and he wants to use you to do it. So again, when you're out there proclaiming the kingdom of God, don't worry about God's will. God's will is yes, go and heal them and then tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Um, I already shared this. Let me see. Uh, let me go on. Again, look at the bottom there. John 14, 12. Those who believe in me will do the works I have been doing. This has come to pass in the life of Pramina, Pranima, Pranima. All right. Again, one more time. Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, again, all right, the Lord commands us to heal the sick when we proclaim the kingdom of God. It's a command. Therefore, it is God's will for the sick to be healed when the kingdom of God is being proclaimed. Okay, just to settle that issue. That issue is settled. When you're proclaiming the kingdom of God, it is God's will for the sick to be healed. And in fact, you are commanded to get the job done. For what purpose? So that the lost will accept Christ and be saved. That's the purpose of these miracles, so that the lost will believe in Jesus and be saved. Now, authority and power over diseases and demons were also therefore given to the 70 disciples who were not apostles, when they were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God. We are commanded to heal the sick who are there when proclaiming the kingdom of God. Therefore, the command to heal the sick does not depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit. No, no, but it depends on the context. When we are preaching the gospel of the kingdom, there we are commanded to heal the sick. Therefore, the command to heal the sick does not depend on whether or not the Holy Spirit leads you to heal the sick. No, no. The Logos, the written word says, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. So remember, obey the written word. Jesus says, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. So you don't need the Holy Spirit to lead you to do that. The command is already there for every believer. Now, by contrast, the operation of the gift of healing may indeed depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example of the operation of the gift of healing. There is a practice, an evangelistic practice called treasure hunting. Some of you may be familiar with it. Now, in this practice, what people normally do is on a Saturday morning, for example, uh, they want to go out to the park and minister to the people there. But before they go out to the park, they first gather somewhere, maybe in church, maybe in a home, and they pray. They first pray and they ask the Lord for words of knowledge 
concerning the people that they will meet later when they go out to the park. So let's say you are in prayer before you go out. And as you pray, you receive uh, a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. And the word of knowledge is the following. Later, you are going to see a man wearing a red sweater, and you are to minister to that man. And after you receive that word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, whatever, you go, How? hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay, I've heard from the Holy Spirit. Now I'm ready. Now let's go. So you all go out to the park. You break up into small groups. You're walking through the park. And then you see a man wearing a bright red sweater. And you say, hallelujah, that's the man the Holy Spirit told me about. So you go up to him. You start ministering to him. And the Lord moves supernaturally through you. And this man accepts Jesus Christ. Okay. So that's an example of this practice called treasure hunting. And this practice depends on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But the operation of authority and power does not depend, not necessarily depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit, but it depends on the context. If you want to preach the gospel to the lost, you can heal the sick, you can cast out demons effectively. That's according to the word of God. Luke 10 verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. All right. Now, this is a very interesting question I want to bring up. Why did Jesus command his disciples to heal the sick before proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom? Typically, we do not do that. Let's say you have a neighbor who is sick and the neighbor doesn't know Jesus. And so one day you go visit your neighbor and what do you do first? Well, first you tell your neighbor about Jesus, about who he is, how he died on the cross to bear our sins, and that if we put our faith in him, our sins are forgiven and we have eternal life. First you share the gospel. And then let's say she accepts Jesus. She says the sinner's prayer. And only after that do you dare to minister to her or him for their physical illness. Only after they accept Christ do you say, okay, now let me ask God to heal you now that you are his child. That's how we typically do it in the church. But according to Luke 10 verse 9, heal the sick comes first. And then you tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Then you preach the gospel. Now, why, why, why? Well, let me tell you why. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you go on a mission trip to a third world country, okay? And you go into a village where there are no believers. It could be an entirely Muslim village, a Hindu village, a Buddhist village, uh, idol worshipers, animists, whatever, okay? And you wanna go from house to house or hut to hut to hut to proclaim the kingdom of God, okay? So you break up into teams and you, and your coworker, your, your team partner, you approach the first hut or the first house, you knock on the door, knock, knock, knock. And then a person opens the door from the inside and there you have standing in front of you, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, an auto worshiper. And in that village, uh, these people hold to their traditional religion very, very, very strongly. Their traditions are very, very strong. And you want to get into that house somehow to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God through Jesus Christ, okay? And so what do you say to that person standing at the door so that he will invite you into his house so that you can share the gospel? Okay, I'm going to give you two vastly different approaches. First, I'll give you approach number one. This is what you say to that Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever standing in front of you. You say something like, now, I'm going to be a little bit sarcastic, but I think you'll get the point, okay? You say, hello, uh, I am a Christian from the United States. I've come all the way from the United States to tell you about the love of God. God loves you so much. Oh, I want to tell you about Christianity. Oh, God loves you so much. He, he gave his only begotten son so that you 
can have eternal life. If you believe in him, your sins are forgiven. So you know, can I come in and tell you about uh, Christianity and about our church? Uh, if you accept Christ, or maybe if, if you come to church this Sunday, you can hear the gospel. You can learn more about Christianity and uh, we'll feed you afterwards. And we'll even take care of your children during the service. Uh, uh, may I come in and tell you more about our God? Okay, that's approach number one, okay? Now, approach number two, knock, 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 knock. The person on the inside comes to you, could be a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, an idol worshiper, whatever, and you say to that person, hello, do you have any sick people in the home whom you would like to have miraculously healed for free? Now, which approach do you think would be more effective in getting you into the home of a Muslim, a Buddhist, an idol worshiper, an animist? And let me tell you, in those villages, there are many, many, many families who have sick people because of their worship. And often they're very ignorant of, you know, sanitary stuff. And so there's a lot of sickness in these villages, all right? In fact, in India, I was told in Indian villages, nine out of every 10 homes has a sick family member, all right? So which approach do you think would be more effective in getting you into that house? And the answer clearly is approach number two. You don't say anything about religion, about Jesus, about church, no, nothing. You just get to the point. Do you have any sick family member, your son, your daughter, your wife who is sick and you would, and, and you would like to see healed for free. Oh boy, they are so excited. They may think you're a witch doctor and you wanna do pro bono, all right? And you say, oh yeah, come on in, come on in, you see? So you don't start with religion. You don't identify yourself as a Christian. You don't wear a huge cross. You don't bring a Bible. No, you heal the sick who are there first. And after the miracle takes place, then the grateful family, now they are ready to hear the gospel of the kingdom, okay? This is how we are to preach the gospel according to the command of Jesus. And in a later session, we're going to study the book of Acts and we will see the same pattern. First, the miracles, and then people accept Jesus Christ. That's what we will see in the book of Acts. But sadly, today in the church, no, we don't follow this. First, we preach the God no yeah first we preach the gospel and maybe we feed the poor we do all that all that stuff to show them how much we love them and then later maybe we might pray for the sick but we usually don't even do that okay now so Jesus gave this command heal the sick who are there and then preach the kingdom of God now did the coming of the spirit at Pentecost later supplant or negate this command to heal the sick even before proclaiming the gospel or leading people to Christ? Yes or no? Did the coming of the Holy Spirit negate this command in Luke 10 verse 9? And the answer is no, not at all. Later, we will see that in the book of Acts, they continued to obey this command. Now, Luke 10 verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. This is what properly trained disciples will experience when they return from ministering on the field. After you are properly trained to heal the sick and cast out demons using power and authority and you go on a mission trip, this is what you're going to experience. You're going to return with joy and say, hallelujah. We saw so many miracles. So many people were healed. So many demons cast out. So many people accepted Christ. Hallelujah. This is what you will experience if you are properly trained exactly as Jesus trained his disciples. You will experience inexpressible joy at what you have witnessed. Believe me. Believe me. Believe me. Once more, Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Okay, I'm not done with this yet. How were they to heal the sick? How? They were to heal the sick by using the supernatural authority given to them by the one true God. 
when powerful supernatural healings take place through you with the use of this authority and not through sacrifices, charms, fetishes, mantras, etc., which are typically used by witch doctors and sorcerers and the like. And that, and those things, sacrifices, charms, fetishes, do not utilize authority. No, no. When you give a sacrifice, when you give someone a charm, a fetish, a mantra, that's not authority. There's no issuing of a command. No. It does not utilize authority. And that is the evidence that when you heal the sick using authority, that's the evidence that the kingdom of the one true God is near through you. Let me clarify this for you. See, sorcerers often offer sacrifices to demons and diseases on behalf of their clients who need healing or deliverance. Okay? They offer sacrifices. Okay? Now, which has greater authority? The one who gives the offering or the one who receives the offering? It is clear that the one who receives the offering has far greater authority. And guess what? All sorcerers and witch doctors can do is to give offerings. Therefore, sorcerers who give offerings have no authority, no authority. They give these offerings to demons and diseases and they say, oh, please, please stop torturing my client so that I can get paid handsomely. Oh, look at this offering. I hope you are pleased and I hope demon you will leave uh, and I hope disease you will leave. You see, that's not authority. But how do servants of God do it? We go in with authority in the name of Jesus. We say, get out, be healed now in Jesus' name. And therefore, the sorcerers cannot represent the one true God who by definition has all authority. And those whom he sends out, he sends out with authority. Jesus sends us out with authority. Our Father in heaven, the one true God who created the heavens and the earth, by definition, has all authority. He sends you out with his supernatural authority to perform extraordinary miracles as evidence to the world that you are, in fact, sent by the one true God and that Jesus is the Messiah, the only way to him. So you see, it's very important how the miracles are done. Witch doctors, yeah, sometimes they do miracles, but it's through sacrifices. It means they have no authority. They're begging demons and diseases to leave, okay? So uh, you put yourself at the mercy of these demons and diseases at their whim. If they want to, if they're happy with the sacrifice, then they leave. But when we go in, it's totally uh, the opposite. We go in with authority from the one true God who has all authority over demons and diseases. And we say, get out in Jesus' name. And they obey. And when the people see that, oh, they know that we are sent by the one true God who has all authority. God sends us out with his authority. Luke 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus replied, verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now, first of all, where do we find snakes and scorpions? See, in verse 19, Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Okay, where do we find them? We find them slithering on the surface of the ground. Therefore, snakes and scorpions represent ground-level enemies like demons. Okay, we have authority to trample on unclean spirits and demons to cast them out. We have authority to overcome all the power of these snakes and scorpions, of these demons, unclean spirits who operate at ground level, tormenting people. Yes, we have that authority. We have that authority over Agents of the enemy who operate at ground level. 
who crawl on the surface of the ground. We can trample on them. They're under our feet. They're under our authority. And Jesus says, nothing will harm you. Now, what? And so what is the immediate context of this wonderful promise that nothing will harm you? Now, why is this important? Because we have heard testimonies of people who have come back from mission trips and something has harmed them. They may be sick. They may be demonized. They may need deliverance. We have heard testimonies of missionaries who come back and indeed the enemy has harmed them. So how do we explain that? Well, we explain it by looking at the context of that promise, nothing will harm you. The context is trampling on snakes and scorpions at ground level, casting out demons, healing the sick at ground level, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God to people, ground level. We have authority at ground level, yes, but that's it, ground level. Once we go beyond the word of God, once we try to lift off from the ground and attack in the heavenlies, that's where you endanger yourself. The immediate context is preaching the gospel to the lost on earth, healing sick people on earth, casting demons out of people on earth, all of which are ground level actions on earth. Therefore, the promise, nothing will harm you, does not necessarily apply when we engage in a practice called strategic level spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. Now, some of you may be familiar with this practice. Now, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this because I don't want you as missionaries to go on the mission field and start engaging in strategic level spiritual warfare. It's not needed. It is not needed for you to bear fruit. Okay, after I finish this, we will go back to healing the sick and casting out demons, okay? Now, strategic level spiritual warfare is a popular practice in which demonic powers, principalities, and territorial spirits in the heavenlies are directly addressed and directly rebuked by a disciple on earth in the name of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, some of you may have engaged in it before. Some of you have heard it, heard of it. And this practice was promoted primarily by Dr. C. Peter Wagner. Uh, he is no longer here on earth. I believe he passed away uh, some years ago. Now, is this practice biblical? That's the key thing here. Now, this teaching is based primarily on Ephesians chapter 6. Chapter 6. So let's go there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Okay, take your stand. Okay, this is the first instance in Ephesians 6 of this expression, take your stand. And take your stand means take your stand. It doesn't mean attack or advance. It means hold your position, take your stand. Okay, So armor, of course, is not for offensive purposes. No, it's not for attacking the enemy, but rather for defensive purposes. That's clear. And take your stand above is a defensive posture. We're not attacking or advancing. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, these are what are often referred to as territorial spirits. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Okay, here we have the second instance of this expression, stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, oh, there's a third instance of this expression, standing, not attacking, not advancing, but standing firm. Again, armor is not for offensive purposes, but rather for defensive ones. 
Armor is enables us to stand our ground, not for advancing and attacking the enemy. Verse 14, stand firm then. Okay, this is the fourth instance of the expression, stand firm, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Four times we are taught to stand and not to attack. Four times in Ephesians 6, which is the primary basis for the practice of strategic level spiritual warfare, four times we are told, stand, stand firm, and not to attack those powers and principalities up above. Verse 16, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith. A shield is for defense not for offense, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It could not be any more clear than that. A shield is for extinguishing the bullets, the flaming arrows from the enemy. It's for defense. Take the helmet of salvation. What is a helmet for? It's for protecting your head and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, swords can also deflect the enemy's thrusts. But you can see that primarily the full armor of God is for defensive purposes, is to take your stand when the enemy attacks. Not once does scripture teach us to attack our enemies in the heavenlies. Not once, but rather at ground level. We do attack the enemy at ground level. We heal the sick. We cast out demons. We preach the gospel. We make disciples. Rather, we are taught to defend ourselves against them by putting on the full armor of God. In Daniel 10, the prophet was not doing spiritual warfare. No, he wasn't. He had no idea what was going on in the heavenlies. He was just fasting before God for 21 days. And after that, Gabriel shows up. Daniel had no idea what was going on in the heavenlies above. It was only after Gabriel explained it to him that Daniel knew what was happening. Spiritual warfare is unbiblical and can be dangerous. Click on that link for testimonies. Testimonies of servants of God who have endangered themselves and their families because they've engaged in a practice which is unbiblical and which God has not given them the authority to do. We have authority over demons at ground level, but not necessarily, in practice, authority over territorial spirits in the heavenly realms, not in practice. I know Dr. we're seated. Lam. Yes. Uh, what, would, what would that actually be? I've never heard of strategic level spiritual warfare. What, what's an example of what that would actually mean to try to okay. attack instead of okay. defend? Sure. Let's say you go on a mission trip to Nepal, okay? And uh, Nepal is a very dark country, uh, primarily Hinduism. So some missionaries would, would climb, they'd climb to the top of uh, Mount Everest, for example, because they want to get as close as possible to the enemy. <laughs> so they climb to the top of Mount Everest, and then they began to directly rebuke the principality of Nepal. They say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke the principality of Nepal, and I command you to leave this area. This area belongs to God. Get out in Jesus' name, okay? They are directly issuing commands to a territorial spirit in the, uh, in the heavenlies, okay? Uh, that is not commanded by God for us to do. To me, that is a dangerous practice, okay? That's what I'm referring to. Uh, wherever you go, and you will find this practice, especially in Africa, uh, they love to do this. They love to rebuke territorial spirits of witchcraft, whatever. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, I, as a young missionary, I learned the hard way. <laughs> Let me tell you, I learned the hard way because I didn't know any better. I started doing this and the enemy attacked me. And so we don't need to do this. Uh, the Lord has shown us a better way. Okay. Uh, does that clear it up, Micah? Hope that clears it up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That cleared it up. And it's okay. also crazy because. The Lord's called me to Nepal. And oh, that, boy. Yeah, okay. so your example is perfect. <laughs> yeah, terrific, terrific. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so 
It, it has to do with directly rebuking territorial spirits. That's about it. You know, if you want, you can pray to God about them. That's fine. Prayer it never hurts. You can say, oh, God, please remove the territorial spirit from Nepal. Fine. Okay. But don't speak directly to them. There's a big difference between talking to God and talking to territorial spirits. Okay. When you're talking to God, you're talking to your father. That's safe. <laughs> but when you're talking to these powerful creatures and you're rebuking them, uh, they can get ticked off at you and come after you. And uh, it will not be pretty. Okay. Y you might get sick and you might even die early. Okay. We have heard of testimonies like that. So just do what we are told to do. What, what are we told to do? Heal the sick, preach the gospel, make disciples. There. That's what we are commanded to do. No more, no less. Okay. Okay. Well, great question, Micah. Thank you. Okay. Let me go on. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord. Good question, brother. Now, Dr. Peter Wagner, uh, he is the founder of this practice. He wrote a book called Confronting the Powers. And on page 152, this is what he said, okay? If we are not satisfied with the fruit of our current evangelistic activities, whatever they may be, strategic level spiritual warfare might at least be worthy of some experimentation. Oh, you get that? he realizes that it's experimental. He knows it's not biblical. What's my response? My response is we can be very satisfied with the fruit of our evangelistic ministry when we are properly trained in the use of the Lord's supernatural authority and power over diseases and demons. If we are properly trained, we are going to see many people healed. We're going to see demons cast out. We're going to see a great harvest of souls wherever God sends us. And we will be very satisfied simply by doing what God has called us to do. No more, no less. Uh, the problem is, I think in the past, the uh, servants of God were not properly equipped with power and authority. And they were not satisfied with the fruit from their current evangelistic activities. So they decided to experiment with strategic level sports, spiritual warfare. They may have seen some results. Okay. They may have seen some results. But let me tell you, they paid the price in unnecessary suffering and trials and tribulations from the enemy. Unnecessary suffering when the enemy decided to retaliate against them. Okay. So. On what should Wagner's experimentation be based? He says uh, it's worthy of experimentation. Okay, on what should we base this experimentation, which has resulted in the teaching of strategic level spiritual warfare? On what should we base it? Well, he writes in his book, Confronting the Powers, nevertheless, certain people such as shamans, witch doctors, practitioners of Eastern religions, New age gurus or professors of the occult on university faculties are examples of the kind of people who may have much more extensive knowledge of the spirit world than most Christians have, meaning we should study. We should learn from them. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. No, we are not going to learn from them. The scriptures give us all we need to know in order to be satisfied, in order to be fruitful in our evangelism. We do not need to learn from shamans, witch doctors, new age gurus, etc. That is laughable. We have all we need to know from the scriptures. Luke 9 verse 1, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them supernatural power, supernatural authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And once you do that, once you do that, guess what? People's eyes will be opened. Grateful families will listen to the gospel and they will receive Jesus. Entire families will accept Jesus Christ and they will want you to come back because they like what they heard and they don't want the demon or the disease to come back to their home. So they say, oh, when can you come back? And you'll say, hey, no problem. I'll come back every Sunday. We'll meet every Sunday right here. <laughs> okay. That's what you do. I'm not getting any sound. I don't know why. Maybe I must have hit something wrong. Oh, 
is that true with everyone? No sound. Okay. Let me see what's going on. I'm getting sound. You're getting sound. Okay. Um, maybe I have you, sound. You got sound now? So you're okay? Who, who does not have sound? Well, <laughs> she's not going to answer. <laughs> who, who's the one who doesn't have sound here? I guess she's not going to answer if she can't hear me. <laughs> um, let me see. I guess, I guess I have no control over that. Okay. Uh, I guess I have to go on. Nothing I can do here. Okay, I'm just going to mute everyone. And if you, if you need an answer like Micah, feel free to unmute, but I'll just mute everyone temporarily here. Okay, here we go. Now, Jesus has given us this supernatural power and authority by which we perform miracles. We cast out demons. And when the families see these miracles, and they have already spent so much time and money and effort on witch doctors and priests and doctors and hospitals to no avail. And when their beloved family member is healed through you in Jesus' name, man, their hearts are wide open. They will be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? And that's how we have 700 house churches in India within, 300, within three years, 700 house churches. Because of the great miracles, entire families accept Christ. They open up their home for a house church, okay? And you can do that wherever God sends you. Now, let's continue. If you want more articles on strategic level spiritual warfare, there are several at that link. You just click on it and you can read a lot more. But if you've never heard of it, that's fine. <laughs> you don't need to learn more about it, okay? Now, let's summarize something. The 12 disciples were given authority and power over disease and demons when Jesus sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. The 70 were also given a measure of this authority and power when they were sent out. Okay. Therefore, what do we conclude? We conclude that a measure of authority and power over disease and demons was given to whomever the Lord sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost. And all of you are sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost. So all of you have received a measure of authority and power over disease and demons. Now, notice the word a measure of authority. Now, why a measure? Well, let me tell you why. Uh, first of all, we do not receive all authority, okay? Only Jesus has all authority, and we as disciples, we receive a measure of his authority, okay? And not only that, uh, it is my own opinion that we do not necessarily all receive the same measure of authority, okay? It's possible that he gives varying levels of authority to different believers, okay? As well as power. However, the good news is that if you are faithful in using whatever measure of authority God has given you to advance his kingdom, if you use that authority and power faithfully, guess what? God knows that you will be faithful in much. Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Let's say the Lord has given you now little authority over diseases and demons. But if you use whatever authority you have to heal the sick and cast out demons and bring people to salvation, then God knows you can be trusted with much and he will promote you in his army. He will give you more authority and more power. That's the good news. All right. So it doesn't matter how much you begin with. It's what you do with whatever God has given you. And if he finds out that you are trusted with the little that he gives you. He knows you will be trusted with much. He will promote you. You will be given great authority in the kingdom of God. Therefore, every disciple, every worker is sent out to the world as a witness of Jesus Christ. So what I have just thought applies to all of us in this Zoom meeting. Now, so question. 
why do we often fail to heal the sick? Okay, every one of us has experienced this. We have tried to minister to someone and they were not healed. Okay. And let me give you a head start on this. Uh, I'll give you a preview of what we're going to be studying a bit later. That's okay. I have some and now I got none. Now you got none. Oh dear. Hmm. Okay, let's see what we can do. Oh, I guess there's maybe hit the microphone on the top left of your screen or the little sound button. I don't know if it's muted. Uh, you're not talking to me, right? You're talking to no, 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 no. Talking no, to the no, sister, true. and she can't yeah. hear, and she cannot hear what you're saying. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. yeah. Oh dear. I don't know what we can do, huh? Lord, help. Uh, helped her lord help her lord show her what is the problem lord show her what to click on so that she can hear lord help her. Ooh, maybe something happened all right okay okay let, let me go on yeah it's okay now can you hear yes well okay let me let me start over Sorry. um let me start let me, let me start over again. So why do we often fail to heal the sick? We often what fail. Uh, what, is she, what is she saying? No, Microphone. How's everything going there? I don't know if that was. This is for an hour. Bystanders to take the bait and mine this storm. Just a minute, Mac. I don't even see Mike. Oh, there's Zoom. Okay, can you hear me? Microphone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? I I think it must be on her end. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Let me continue. So why do we often fail to heal the sick? We often fail primarily because of the doubt, the little faith that we have that the person will be healed. Matthew 17, verse 19, which we will study later. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Meaning, why couldn't we drive out the spirit of epilepsy? Verse 20, he replied, because you have so little faith. We fail because of the what if. We're always thinking, what if the person is not healed? We're always thinking that, which means we have doubt that the person will be healed. This doubt and this little faith are addressed later in this teaching in depth. In, in a moment. Um, I'm going to skip. Oh, yeah. Let me just read to you a few more reports from India so that you will know the kind of fruit that you will expect when you go abroad as a missionary. Okay. This is from India. And Micah in Nepal, you should see the same thing because India and Nepal are very similar. Okay. Very similar. They're both prim primarily Hindu countries. Okay. Let me read this. On his way to his ministry field, one of our disciples saw a man with a horribly swollen neck. He stopped and asked him what had happened to his neck. He replied he had cancer. Despite the poverty in which they lived, the family had spent the equivalent of over $4,000 for treatment. There's no insurance, okay? But to no avail. His neck was swollen like a balloon. Our worker asked if he could visit him at his home where he would pray over him for healing and also share the gospel with him. The man agreed. Of course, of course, the man wants to be healed of this horrible cancer. The next day in the evening, two of our trained workers went to his home where they ministered to him for over an hour. Okay, and during that hour, nothing happened. But one thing we have taught our workers is you do not give up. You persevere. If nothing happens, you come back again the next day. All right? Remember when Jesus ministered to that blind man, he didn't minister just once and then leave the results up to God. No, he made sure that it was complete. He ministered a second time, and only then the man could see clearly. 
That's what we do. We continue ministering until the healing is complete. And so the last sentence, they said that they would come back the following day. But when they were about to leave, the cancerous tumor on his neck burst before their eyes like a balloon. The family members were amazed. He was completely healed. The entire family came to Christ. You see, so often we see entire families coming to Christ in this way. And so we're not dividing families. No, the whole family comes to Christ because of the great miracle done for one of the family members. Typically on the mission field, yeah, people, you get one person saved here, one person saved there. And if it's a Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist culture, then you got persecution from within the family, within the, from the parents and so forth, okay? We don't really see that because we have entire families coming to Christ after a powerful miracle happening for a family member whose sickness was hopeless. They tried doctors, hospitals, witch doctors, Ayurvedic medicine, everything, nothing works. And so they are so grateful when their family member is healed, the whole family comes to Christ. In a village called Fasala, there were eight people in a family. They would all suffer from various problems, sometimes from fever, from pain in their legs, from bad dreams, etc. They thought it was the work of demons, so they called a sorcerer who had them sacrifice a goat and a chicken. Okay, you get it? The, the sorcerer sacrifices the goat and the chicken to these demons, okay? Uh, asking the demons, oh, please, please, please stop tormenting this family, my clients, please, okay? That's the whole idea be behind offering sacrifices. There's no authority. You're just begging, you're just pleading, hoping to satisfy the demons. No authority. They also paid the sorcerer to perform other acts of worship, but nothing happened. Our workers went there and threw out all the items used in idol worship, and then ministered to the family members. Our Lord graciously delivered that family from the demonic attacks. In a completely unreached Hindu village, there was a man who had been very weak over a period of three years. He had difficulty walking and was so helpless, he could hardly do anything. The family took him to a doctor who did several scans and other tests, but he did not find anything. They tried various treatments, including allopathic medicine, but there was no improvement. The family heard about our Elijah Challenge workers, okay, and called them for prayer. Two of our brothers went to the village and began ministering to the man in the name of Jesus. Okay? This is what typically happens uh, when miracles take place. Word spreads about you or your workers, and when people need healing guess who they call they call you or one of your workers they've tried everything else now as a last resort they're going to try one of your workers whom you have trained okay to their surprise all of a sudden the man's wife started shouting i will kill him and not let him go she screamed for a few minutes non-stop the demon manifested itself through the wife shrieking and screeching our Elijah Challenge workers calmly ministered to both of them, and the demon came out of the man and his wife. Following this extraordinary deliverance, the man was able to walk. The whole family, as well as one of the relatives, accepted our Lord Jesus. A new fellowship, that is, a new house church, has started up in that village because of this miracle. An elderly woman was suffering from heart disease for two years. After our worker ministered to her, she was miraculously healed. And now we are hearing many, many testimonies of people being healed of heart disease. A total of 14 house churches have been planted in the month of February alone, and that was in the year 2019. Okay, now, I have some reports about things you can do in the West, okay? For example, in America. But uh, I think I'm going to skip them. Maybe I'll go through them next year, uh, excuse me, uh, next week, okay? But there are things that you can do right here at home in which you use 
these miracles to draw people to Jesus Christ. You can go into the prisons, you can go door to door, you can go to new age festivals and heal the sick and you will outdo the prophets of Baal at these new testament, at these new age festivals. Uh, I have testimonies from all of these events. So get hold of this PowerPoint presentation and you can click on that link and you can read the report. It's really fantastic. Uh, one time we had disciples trained in Las Vegas and after the training, we sent them out to the Vegas Strip holding a sign that says free miraculous healing. <laughs> Guess what happened? Oh boy, okay. And uh, you can do uh, healing outreach at your local supermarket. You put up a big sign, okay. Now this is what we did about 20 years ago. We went to a local Asian uh, shopping mall in the Houston area. We no, brought- same old thing. I still can't get found. Excuse me, I didn't hear you. Well, I guess it doesn't help. Anyway, we brought this big sign and we, put it on, and we put it on top of a shopping cart that was okay? and we waited for people to come to us because in that, in that Asian shopping mall, <laughs> uh, let, let me just, um, excuse me for a moment. Let me just mute all here. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Now, if I were to do the same thing, I would change the wording on this sign. I would not say healing prayer. Why? Because prayer is too religious. I don't want to draw religious people. I'm not interested in drawing Christians. I'm interested in drawing unbelievers, atheists. So I would not use the word healing prayer. I would just use the word free healing, free miraculous healing. Okay. Uh, at the top is the translation in Vietnamese and over here it's Chinese. Okay. Again, I would not use healing prayer. I would use the wording, free miraculous healing, okay? And at this mall, 80 to 90% of the infirm people we ministered to were miraculously healed. And after that, we shared the gospel to the people who were healed. Okay, uh, this is a very interesting video from uh, Congo where I was in 2006. Uh, very interesting at what happened, okay? Uh, many people, many of these African people, they turned to the Lord after they saw the miracles. And you can see it in the video. Okay, Now, let me go on. Drug addicts can quickly be delivered from the craving for the drug by the use of authority and mountain-moving faith. You may know something. You may know someone right here in the States. You may know an area where there are a lot of drug, drug addicts, but you know, Drug addiction consists of a demonic component as well as a physical component. And we have authority in both areas, in both the demonic and the physical. And so if there's a drug addict who wants to be set free, you minister to them with power and authority and the craving will immediately leave. Even people addicted to nicotine can be miraculously set free immediately as you exercise authority and power over their addiction, okay? But they must accept Christ after they are set free. If they do not, the demon can and will return, and it could be worse than before. You will find that in Luke 11, verses 24 through 26, okay? And here is Luke eleven twenty-four. 24, when an impure spirit comes out of a person it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it okay for example if the spirit of cocaine addiction comes out of a person it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it then it says i will return to the house i left when it arrives it finds the house swept clean and put in order meaning that addict has not accepted christ as lord and savior it's empty then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they all go in and they go in and live there, okay? Therefore, drug addicts, uh, before you minister to them, you have to warn them that if they're, after they are set free, they have to repent and accept Christ. If they do not, it could get worse. The final condition of that person is worse than the first. All right, now, why are the sick often not healed when we minister to them? Okay, every one of us, we have laid hands on the sick. We have 
given commands and so forth. And usually the person is not healed. Why? Let's find out. So every disciple has been given a measure of this supernatural authority and power over disease and demons for sharing the gospel with the lost. Yes, we see that. But why does often nothing happen when we minister to the sick using authority and power as Jesus did? Why? What are we doing wrong? Now, often we will blame the sick person for lacking faith. We say, oh, you're not healed because you lack faith. We tell the sick person, hey, you got to claim your healing by faith. Just claim it, claim it, and trust God. And so if they're not healed, well, it's because you lack faith. You didn't claim hard enough, all right? You lack faith. But did Jesus ever tell infirm people who came to him to simply claim their healing? And later, they would receive their healing. Did Jesus ever do that? No, he actually performed the healing. So why is it in the church today, in certain streams of the church today, we tell people, well, you have to claim your healing. And if you don't claim good enough, you're not going to be healed. You know why we do that? Because we can't heal the sick as Jesus did anymore. We don't know how John 14, 12 can be fulfilled. We don't know how to heal the sick as Jesus did. And so now we put the burden upon the sick person. If they're not healed, it's their fault. Can you imagine that? Now, of course, we are familiar with the following scripture. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So we know that because in his own hometown, he didn't have honor. The people didn't believe that he was a prophet. And so they lacked faith in him. And so he couldn't do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Okay. But note that even with the lack of faith of the hometown people, Jesus was still able to heal a few sick people. Although the sick having faith can be a factor, let me repeat that. Although the sick having faith can be a factor in the Gospels, Jesus never blamed the sick people by saying that they were not healed because they lacked faith. No, Jesus never said that. Some who had no faith were actually healed like the invalid at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. He didn't have any faith, but Jesus healed him. And the lame beggar at the temple gate in Acts chapter 3. That lame beggar, when he saw Peter and John, he asked them for money. He wasn't accepting a healing. He didn't have faith for a healing. He wasn't expecting one. But Peter healed him anyway, okay? So it is possible for people who have no faith to, to be healed. That is possible. And uh, having faith can be a factor in someone being healed. Yes. But we will see that Jesus in, instead emphasized the little faith in his disciples when someone they ministered to was not healed. We will see that Jesus instead emphasized the little faith in his disciples when someone they ministered to was not healed. This is a very important factor, which is not taught in the church today. It is not taught. When people are not healed, what do we say? Oh, it's not God's will. It's not God's time. The sick person has sinned. The sick person lacks faith. We never talk about the faith of the one who is ministering. So let us now examine the consequence of little faith in the disciple who is ministering the healing. All right? Okay. Let's look at the first failure of the disciples, the first failure of three, which we are going to study. The disciples failed to heal a boy who had severe epilepsy. Matthew 17, verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. 
He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Now, was the father fully expecting the disciples to heal his son? And the answer, I believe, is yes. The father had a boy who had severe epilepsy. One day he saw the disciples and he recognized them as the disciples of Jesus Christ who could perform the miracles. So he thought, hey, surely his disciples can heal my son. So he brought his son to the disciples and they did their best. Jesus had already given them supernatural power and authority over diseases and demons. But despite that, they could not heal him. The father was very disappointed. He went to look for Jesus and he tattled on them. He reported to Jesus. Hey, I brought him disciples. I brought my son to your disciples, but they could not heal him. What's going on here, Jesus? The father was fully expecting the disciples to heal his son. Now, today, 2,000 years later, does the world today look for believers to perform miraculous healings? As we see in India, that's what we're seeing in India now. When, when families with a sick family member, they've tried everything, nothing happens. They do look for our workers to perform the miraculous healing. Yes, it's happening in India, but in general, today, for example, in America, in the West, does the world look for believers to perform miraculous healings? And the answer is no, 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 they do not. They go to doctors, they go to hospitals. Not that they shouldn't go to doctors, they shouldn't go to hospitals, they should not take medicine. No, I'm not saying that, but definitely they do not look for believers to perform miracles, no. Now, how did Jesus feel about their failure to heal the boy? What did Jesus say when he heard that they had failed to perform a miracle? Did Jesus say to them, oh, hey, guys, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Who do you think you are? You're not God. You're not me. Only I can perform miracles. Only God can perform miracles. Who are you? You're just sinners saved by grace. Forget it. Don't worry about it, guys. Is that what Jesus said to these disciples? who had just failed to perform a miracle. No, look what Jesus said. You unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus rebukes them very, very harshly. He calls them unbelieving and perverse. Jesus is upset and disappointed with them. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? He is really ticked off at them, not because they had committed some horrible sin, but because they had failed to perform a miracle. Absolutely incredible. Can you imagine your pastor saying that to you after you failed to heal someone? Absolutely not. No pastor would ever say that to a deacon or an elder who had failed to perform a miracle. That's nonsense. <laughs> well, huh, makes you wonder, right? Makes you wonder about the church today, doesn't it? Now, did Jesus fully expect his disciples to heal the boy? And the answer, obviously, is yes. He was so disappointed with them that he called them unbelieving and perverse. And he was like, get out of here. How long do I need to put up with you guys? Come on. He was really upset at them. He was so disappointed because he fully expected them to heal the boy. Now, does Jesus have the same expectation of disciples today of you and me? Yes, or maybe Jesus has changed. It's been 2,000 years, and now he's mellow. Now he's more gracious and forgiving. Is that possible? Has he changed? No. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe Jesus has the same expectation of you and me today. But that's crazy, right? How could Jesus have possibly expected and even demanded his disciples to do the miracle? How could Jesus expect us 
and demand that we do miracles. That's unreasonable. This could not contrast more sharply with our traditions and thinking today, right? I mean, his expectation and demands were unreasonable according to our thinking and traditions today. It's completely unreasonable. Expecting and demanding disciples to perform miracles? Come on, give me a break, all right? Now, let me give you three reasons why Jesus was, in fact, very reasonable when he rebuked his disciples for failing to perform the miracle, for failing to drive out the demon of epilepsy from the boy. Let me give you three reasons. Reason number one, they were his disciples, and they were being trained to do what they saw him doing time after time after time. He would take them wherever he went. And wherever he went, he would be preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. His disciples were with him. They were watching him and observing him and learning to do what they saw him doing. And Jesus was training them to do what he was doing, training them to take over after he left. They were being trained to do what Jesus did. Reason number two, he had given them supernatural authority, supernatural power to heal the sick and cast out demons right? He gave, he gave it to them. The supernatural authority and power that he had to heal the sick and cast out demons, now he gave it to his disciples in Luke 9, verse 1 and 2. Reason number three, he had sent them out and commanded them to heal the sick. He commanded them to heal the sick. That means get it done, get it done. I want the sick healed, and then the gospel preached to them, get it done. They failed to heal the boy which means they failed to obey the command to heal the sick. And when we disobey God's commands, he is not pleased. Now I'm talking to disciples, okay? Disciples, not outsiders, not baby believers, but disciples. Then back to Matthew 17, Jesus says, okay, bring the boy here to me. I'll take care of it. Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Okay, how did Jesus perform the miracle? Did he pray to God? Did he prophesy? Did he say, hallelujah, Father? No, he rebuked the demon. He exercised authority over the demon. He commanded it to go, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Jesus exercised authority. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Now, that is the question for which we need the answer. Why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus had already given them authority to drive out all demons, right? So what was missing? Why did they fail? Something essential was missing. They already had authority. They had power. So something was missing. What was missing? But first, let's look at the four reasons that we typically give to explain why the sick are not healed when we minister to them. Okay? Look at the four reasons that we usually hear. We will say, well, it's not God's will. That's why the person is not healed. It's not God's will. Oh, it's not God's time. Okay. Or we will say, well, the sick person has sinned. They need to confess their sin first before they can be healed. And then number four, well, the sick person lacks faith. Uh, he or she didn't claim hard enough. He or she didn't believe hard enough. The sick person lacks faith. That's why they are not healed. Now, some of these reasons might apply. I'm not saying none of them apply, okay? Some of these reasons might apply, for example, when it's time for the person to go home to the Father. Let's say you've got a believer in your church. She's 100 years old. She has served the Lord faithfully for 80 years, and now she's sick, and she wants to go home. Yeah, in that case, it might not be God's will to heal her. It's maybe God's time to take her home, all right? I accept that. Or if there's a sick believer who has unforgiveness 
in her heart against another believer and they don't want to forgive that person. They don't want to confess the sin of unforgiveness. Okay, so some of these reasons might at times apply. Okay, however, however, when we say, well, it's not God's will, it's not God's time, who are we essentially blaming? We are actually blaming God. God says, no, God is not ready. It's God's fault. But what if it's not God's fault? Then who do we blame? Well, we blame the sick person. Well, the sick person has unconfessed sin. The sick person lacks faith. They don't claim hard enough. We essentially blame the sick person if we're not blaming God. Now, very, very convenient, is it not? Very, very convenient. We never blame ourselves when the miracle does not take place. We, the one who is ministering, we never blame ourselves when the person is not healed. Never, 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 never. We much rather blame God or the sick person, okay? And this is what I call the blame game. It's our human nature not to wanna to take personal responsibility for apparent failure. We always wanna blame someone else, right? Right. And where do we get this disposition? Well, from Adam and Eve, our first ancestors. You recall in the Garden of Eden, after Adam took of the forbidden fruit and ate it, and Adam and God approached him and said, what have you done? And what did Adam say? Well, the, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. Okay. Who did Adam blame? He didn't take personal responsibility. He blamed Eve. And then God turns to Eve, and what does Eve say? Well, the serpent that you, the serpent that was in the garden, he, he deceived me, okay? Eve blames the serpent, okay? The blame game. We just don't like to take personal responsibility. That's our old nature, okay? But what reason did Jesus give in this particular situation to explain why the miracle did not take place? Was it because it wasn't God's will to heal this boy? Or was it because the father lacked faith or the boy had sinned? Is that the reason? Let's see. He replied, because you have so little faith. You have so little faith. So whose fault was it that the miracle did not take place? Whose fault was it? It was the fault of the disciples. Why? because they had so little faith. This was their first failure to perform a miracle the Lord commanded them to do as recorded in scripture. Next time, we will look at two more failures. This is the first. They failed to do the miracle that Jesus expected them to do because they had little faith. They experienced two more failures, which we shall study later. Now, do we ever blame ourselves for having little faith when a sick person is not healed? Do we ever say, oh, I'm sorry, it's my fault you're not healed because of my little faith? No, we never blame ourselves when the sick person is not healed. Never, never, almost never. Unless you've been trained, you will never blame yourself, okay? That would be tantamount to ministering condemnation, which is a no-no in evangelical circles. We never want to minister condemnation to anyone, make them feel bad, okay? So I guess Jesus is ministering condemnation to his disciples because he blamed them for failing to heal a boy, all right? Instead, in the church today, we blame God or the sick person, okay? We never blame ourselves. We don't want to make people feel bad, so we don't blame ourselves, no. Now, let's return to Jesus' response to his disciples, okay? He replied, because you have so little faith. What kind of faith did they lack? I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, okay? Jesus is telling them that they lack faith as a mustard seed. He did not say faith as small as a mustard seed. Some translations, some of the English translations, for example, like the NIV, they render this verse, 
I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that, that is an incorrect translation. Jesus is not encouraging them to have faith as small as a mustard seed. No, he's encouraging them to have faith as a mustard seed with the nature of a mustard seed. The Greek simply says faith as a mustard seed, not faith as small as a mustard seed. A mustard seed is very little, all right? Jesus just rebuked his disciples for having little faith. So how could he be encouraging them now to have faith as a must, faith as small as a mustard seed? No, he's not focusing on the size of a mustard seed, but rather on the nature of the mustard seed. The King James Version has it right. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed. Now, Let's look at faith as a mustard seed. Let's look at it in detail. Back again to Matthew 17, 20. He replied, because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. All right. Now, who's the one moving the mountain? Of course, we know God can move mountains. Yes, we sing songs about God moving mountains. Yes. But who is the one speaking to the mountain here? Who is the one moving the mountain? You, you, you. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there. You will issue a command to this mountain, move from here to there. You will issue a command to this mountain, to this disease, to this demon, move, go. So here. Jesus is introducing mountain-moving faith. Mountain-moving faith, which is equivalent to faith as a mustard seed. With mountain-moving faith, you will command mountains, diseases, and demons to move, to go. Mountain-moving faith is exercised by issuing authoritative commands to diseases and demons. Again, mountain moving faith is exercised by issuing commands, authoritative commands to diseases and demons which are under our authority. Matthew 17, 20, once again, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, to this demon, to this disease, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. All right. The disciples failed because they did not have faith as a mustard seed or mountain moving faith. That's why they failed to heal the boy. They already had enough authority and power. From Jesus, it was enough. Whatever the Lord gave them was enough. But they were lacking the third component. The component, it's called faith as a mustard seed or mountain moving faith. When they issued commands to the demon to go, they did not issue the commands with mountain moving faith. Instead, they had doubt, doubt in their hearts. Therefore, faith as a mustard seed can move mountains, demons, and diseases. Mountain moving faith. Verse 21 does not appear in all of the Greek manuscripts. Verse 21, but all of you are familiar with it, so we need to look at it. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now. The traditional understanding of this verse sees this kind of demon, this kind of demon, as far too powerful for the disciples to cast out. Only God can do it after we pray and fast. That's the traditional understanding of that verse. Man, no, you can't cast that demon out. Sorry, it's too big for you. The only thing you can do is pray and fast, and then I'll take care of it. God will take care of it. You can do nothing. But that makes no sense. That interpretation makes no sense. Why? Because Jesus clearly expected the disciples to succeed in driving out the demon. 
Jesus clearly expected them to be able to drive out the demon. So how could he say afterwards that, hey, you know, actually this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Makes no sense at all. So the traditional interpretation of verse 21 is totally inconsistent with the context. So how do we interpret verse 21? This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Well, prayer and fasting increase our mountain moving faith. When you pray and fast, your mountain moving faith increases and afterwards, after you finish praying and fasting, and you have strong faith, strong mountain moving faith, with which you can cast out such demons successfully. So prayer and fasting do have a role in this. Prayer and fasting, you first pray and fast. And as you pray and fast, your mountain moving faith increases. After you are done fasting, then you go out. You face the enemy. You see sick people as you're preaching the gospel and you heal them in Jesus name with supernatural authority and power because now you have strong mountain moving faith. You have enough faith to heal the sick and cast out demons because you have prayed and fasted before going out. Now, let me share with you what's coming up soon. When the disciples tried to cast out the demon from the boy in Matthew 17, they failed to exercise mountain moving faith. That's why they failed. They had authority from Jesus, but when they exercised that authority, when they issued the command to the demon of epilepsy, they did not exercise mountain moving faith. They were not sure that the demon would come out in the name of Jesus. They were thinking, oh, what if this demon doesn't come out? What are we gonna do then? You gotta get rid of that what if, no. When you tell your dog to sit, do you think to yourself, what if the dog doesn't sit? What should I do then? No, you don't think that when you tell your dog to sit. You have authority over your dog, you can make him sit. It's the same thing with demons. You cannot have any doubt that the demon will not leave. When you do have doubt, the demon will sense the doubt in your words and it will not leave. The disciples essentially doubted their authority over demons already given by Jesus. And because of that doubt, they lacked mountain moving faith. They had little faith. And as a result, they failed. The demon would not obey their commands. And so one thing you learn now is do not doubt the authority that Jesus has given you over diseases and demons. He has given you supernatural authority. And so when you command demons and diseases to go, there's no what if. They must leave. They're under your authority. They must leave. And you're going to get them out. No matter what, they are leaving because they are under your authority. And you're going to persevere until they do get out. In the name of Jesus. That's what we treat. That's how we teach our workers in India. You don't give up. You have authority over this demon, over this disease. It will leave if you do not give up. It is under your authority. Of course, they don't want to leave. They don't want to obey your commands. You force them out. And part of forcing them out involves perseverance and persistence. Not giving up. Not doubting your authority. Now, next, next Thursday, we will begin with this. We're going to resolve the conflicting accounts in Matthew 17 and Mark 9 with regard to the boy with epilepsy, okay? There, there are apparent conflicts between these two accounts, and we're going to resolve them next time, okay? Now, praise the Lord. Okay, I am going to stop sharing. And now we want to take time to actually apply the authority that God has given us. Okay, so let's see.
Is everyone still there? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. I'm okay. trying to. Oh, there we go. There we go. Praise the Lord. Good to see everyone. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We want to apply this power and authority to heal the sick. Now, is there anyone out there with a heart condition? Anyone with a heart condition? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I'm not saying it's wonderful you have a heart condition, but it's wonderful you are going to be healed. <laughs> We're going to see a miracle. Okay. That's why I say wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, is that... Uh, Oh, I, I, I'm Joe, actually. You're, you're Joe. Tonight, and I'm taking her place. Oh, okay. And she's yeah. on, a, on an appointment. She'll be here anytime now. Okay. So, who has the heart condition? Anne, introduce yourself. Oh. I do. Joe. Oh, Anne. Okay. Anne, uh, tell us the nature of your heart condition. Okay. No, Anne or Joe? Anne. Oh, sorry. Jo Anne, who, thought you said your name was Anne. Who, who has the heart condition? Joe. 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 Joe, okay. Uh, Joe, tell me the nature of, of your heart condition, okay? Specifically, because I don't go to a doctor per se, but I went to one and he thought I'd be dead at this point. Wow, so, okay. <laughs> Praise um, God. All surprise, right. surprise. I don't listen to doctors. Um, I would say it's, it's a hereditary thing in the family. Okay. And um, basically it's... Um, what do you call it? Yeah, my daughter. I can't get words from you. Um, <laughs> congestive heart failure, you know, is a genetic thing. Okay. Um, I had, I had, I had um, passed out a couple of years ago in the yard and okay. went to the ER. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. But they thought I had um, hardening of the arteries. Okay. All that, all that, yes. that goes with that. Okay. Um, I believe I was healed from that. Yeah. And then last January, I got COVID. Oh. And it, it like all came back. And I, I actually felt my heart like rip, if oh. that makes sense. I never went in to have it checked because, again, I'm not going to believe the doctors. So I just trust God will heal me because okay. he will. But I've had okay. COVID two more times since then. Oh. <laughs> and each time it, it affects my heart. I can tell it's affecting my heart. Do you still have COVID or you're not sure? You I just, just got over COVID okay. again from okay. the conference. <laughs> okay, now, I want to know about the symptoms that you have because of your heart condition. For example, can you climb stairs? Can you exert yourself? Can I you do very, things like that? I get very winded now doing stairs. Okay. Do, and, do, do you have stairs in the house where you are right now? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to minister to you. And I believe that you're going to feel a big difference. That's why I ask about the stairs, okay? Because I want you to test yourself no, after I'm, we minister to you, right? I'm just going to do this. Is that okay? I'm going to do this last night. <laughs> the stairs. Okay, we'll do it. Okay. We'll do it. And, and I'll say, okay, is there a difference? All right. And uh, if this stuff really works, you'll say, hey, yeah, uh, it, it feels great. Uh, I'm not winded, okay? So okay. let's see whether or not this stuff really works. Okay. okay, I believe that. So, you see, uh, we teach about healing. Now it's not just words. You, you better get it done, right? Especially in front of unbelievers, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus. You better get it done right in front of them, okay? Exactly. You, you can't just say, well, let's just trust God, you know, hopefully. No, you want to do this in front of Muslims and Buddhists, you better do it right then and there. Just like Elijah at Mount Carmel, right? Before the false prophets. He did it then and there. Okay, this is the kind of boldness that servants of God need to have today. Because and I actually had somebody come up to me at church this week because we pray for people. Yeah. And I administered healing on that person for the exact same thing. And oh. I just had a laugh. And God was like, okay, you're going to heal that person, but are you going to heal? Are, okay. are you going to let me heal you? Okay, now That's it's your turn. Good. Okay, so right. here's what we're going to do. We're going to apply what we have been learning. Um, we've been learning about authority and power, okay? So power is transferred through the laying on of hands. So I'm going to have Anne later lay hands over your heart, okay? You're Anne, right? This is, and you're this Joe. This is Electa, I'm Joe. Oh, Electa. Electa. I don't know you, who Anne is. Electa, you look different this week. Did you, <laughs> did you, did you dye your hair or something? It's oh, sorry. Dark. No, it's dark it's in just, here. It's just dark, it's my oh. lighting. Oh, you look different. I didn't recognize you, okay. 
you're elected and you're Joe. Joe. Okay. Yeah, so, so later, Electa, you're going to lay hands over her heart, okay? Yes. In order for the healing power to flow. And then at the same time, we are going to issue commands to your heart. We're going mm -hmm. to command your heart to be healed and to restore. I Got should, that? should I add something? Go and ahead. I don't know if there's an issue, but I, I was once diagnosed with a microvalve prolapse. Oh. But I was healed of that. That's why I say I have been healed before. Okay. Because I went back and actually got physical records saying you have no show for a, a microvalve prolapse. Okay. So that's history of that. Yeah. So I know I once was healed of that. Okay. So okay. what, uh, so we're not going to pray for you. I'm sure you have prayed a lot over this. So that's done. So wrong. now we are simply going to issue commands as Electa lays hands on you. Mm -hmm. And I will command your heart to be restored. Okay, now when Jesus ministered to the sick, often it was just one word or two, okay, and it was done. Now right. we are not exactly at that level, so sometimes we need to say a few more commands, which I think is okay because we're still learning, okay. So sometimes what I do is I, I'm very specific, I might speak to your valves and command the valves to open and close normally in Jesus' name. Uh, I might say, I command all arteries to open up in Jesus' name, okay. Now, Jesus, I don't think, did that because he had so much authority. Just one word, it was done. But we're still learning. So uh, I, may, I may say a bit more than what Jesus might have done, okay? I might say a few more sentences. But just to give you an idea of what we do, okay? We give commands directly to where it is needed. For example, uh, the man had a, he had a withered arm. So Jesus spoke to the arm. Stretch out your arm, okay? So now I'm going to speak to your heart in that same way, okay? Mm -hmm. So, are we ready for this? Yes, I'm ready. So, Electa, uh, where is your heart, Joe? I'm not a doctor, so I don't know where it is. Okay, Electa, put your hand there, okay? Now, when you lay your hands there, a healing power is going to flow, okay? So, you might even feel something. It's possible sometimes people feel heat, or they might not. But if you do feel something, it's healing power from Jesus and Electa flowing into your heart to heal you, okay? Okay, that's power. Now we're going to exercise authority by issuing commands, authoritative commands. That means no doubt. Okay. <laughs> Jesus said that infirmities are under our authority, which includes your heart condition. And so if it's under my authority, why should I have any doubt? Why should I think, oh, what if she's not healed? No, that's garbage. Mm -hmm. It's like your dog. You tell your dog to sit. You don't say, what if he doesn't sit? No, he's going to sit. I'll make him sit. Amen. I don't care if he doesn't want to sit. I'm his boss. I'll make him sit. Okay, that's the mm -hmm. attitude when it comes to ministering to the sick. I'm the boss. You do what I say. Okay, got that? Okay, no more of this what if business. That's garbage. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Okay, and this is especially when you are proclaiming the kingdom of God to the lost. Okay, when you're ministering to believers, it can be a bit different, but now we're talking about Let's say this is an evangelistic situation, okay? And uh, let's see. Okay, are we ready? Now, here's what I want everyone to do. I'm going to give the commands and everyone repeat them after me. You're going to be speaking directly to Joe. You're not talking to the air. You're not talking to God. You're not talking to me. You're speaking, speaking directly to Joe. In particular, you're speaking to her heart, okay? The heart is under our authority. We're going to speak to her heart. Okay. Should we, should we close our eyes? Yes or no? No. 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 We're not praying. <laughs> We're attacking an enemy. When you attack an enemy, never close your eyes. Amen. But you Amen. aim your weapon and you pull the trigger. How do we pull the trigger? Mountain moving faith. Give the commands with mountain moving faith. Okay. Is everyone ready? Now, yes. repeat these commands after me with, Row! you know what I mean? The mother bear spirit Row! with authority, okay? Yeah. So you, you're not just saying some mantra. No, no mantras. You're giving commands to an enemy who is under your authority. You're going to beat him to a pulp. Got that? Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. In the name of Jesus Christ. Repeat in, the In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke this heart condition. I rebuke this, I rebuke heart, this condition. heart condition. Heart condition. Be totally healed now. Totally, totally, healed, totally now. healed now. 
Valves open, close, normally, now. Valves, valves, valves open, open, open close, closed, normally, closed, now. normally, now. Completely restored in Jesus' name. Completely, Completely restored, restored in, Jesus in, Jesus in Jesus' name. Heart beat normally. Heart, heart, heart beat, beat normally. normally. All arteries open up in Jesus' name. All, All arteries, arteries open, up, open, in up, in open up in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Blood flow normally in the name of Jesus. Blood, blood, blood flow normally, normally in the name, in the name of, Jesus. of Jesus. Jesus heals you. Jesus, Jesus heals, heals, you. heals you. Okay. Now, before I ask you to get up, uh, do you feel anything? It's, no. You don't have to feel anything. It's okay. I was feeling heat. You were feeling heat. Okay. Now I'm feeling dizzy up here. Ah. But I am feeling heat. You're feeling heat. Okay. Uh, Joe, stand up. Okay. How does that feel? I'm sorry, what? How does that feel standing up? You feel okay? I'm not feeling anything, but yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Should okay. Now stairs? go climb the stairs and then right. come back. Go All ahead. Right. We'll wait for you. When I'm gone, you can pray on Chris. Yes. And now, if we want, we can continue. Say, in the name of Jesus, completely restored, Joe. Your heart function normally, beat normally, in Jesus' name, right now. Healed, totally restored, in the name of Christ. Heart strengthened, Amen. heart restored, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, why do I keep doing this? Because often, healing the sick is like moving a mountain. Okay? Remember Jesus... When he healed the blind man, he did it twice. It was a process. In the same way, healing is often a process. You're moving a mountain inch by inch, meter by meter, yard by yard until it goes into the sea. So don't just minister once. If, if, if necessary, minister as many times as you need to move that mountain into the sea. And once it goes into the sea, that family will be so grateful because they've tried everything under the sun. Nothing has worked. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's worth a little bit of sweat. Now. She's coming? She's doing one more flight of stairs. One more flight. That's a good sign. <laughs> okay. Did you hear that, guys? She's doing <laughs> one more flight. That's a good sign. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. She's coming back. Okay. How okay. do you feel, Joe? I'm a little winded, but I'm good. A little winded. Yeah. Hallelujah. I would feel a little winded, too, if I climbed the stairs <laughs> twice. Okay. <laughs> I did it about five times. Five times. Yeah. Wow. You climbed the stairs five times. Yeah, I got a double <laughs> flight, so I did it five times. Yeah. Okay. Now. But I'm good. I'm not passing out. Okay. So this is normally it would be very different, right? After yeah. what you just did, normally it would be very different, correct? Yeah, I'd be laying down. <laughs> You'd be lying down. She wouldn't be smiling and laughing. Okay. So I believe God has done something. There is a change. Yeah. Amen. I know He has. Okay. You want to get prayer? Okay, plus. Get ministered. Okay, yeah. so. Heart. So do you see what, does everyone see what God has done? Okay. Yeah. It was very simple. Power through the laying on of hands and issuing commands with no doubt. It's like you're going into the ring, okay? And you're going to knock your opponent out, okay? No more ifs, no more doubts. I will get the job done. You see, Jesus says heal the sick, right? That means get it done, Right. Isn't that what healing the sick means? Get it done and then tell them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Okay, no more of this wishy-washy stuff. Amen. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We are going to get the job done. Okay. Amen. I'm sorry. Sometimes in the church, you get a lot of wishy-washy stuff. Okay, so and so we come out like this. Huh? They don't teach authority. No, they don't teach authority. Nope. Uh, yeah, I have reasons for this, but yeah, that's, that's for another time, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> because, well, yeah, th there's a lot on my heart that I could share because I have been doing this for many, many years. So I think I understand the state of the church by now. Okay. Oh, yes. uh, I mean, I've been a pastor for many years. I was a missionary evangelist. So I, I've been around the block a couple of times, so I know what's going on. Okay. So praise the Lord. Is, is there anyone else with a heart condition? Oh, all right. All right. All I'm right. glaring at my husband, but he's not. He says he's good. He so says he's good. <laughs> all right. Uh, but we'll, well, we can pray for his back. Why don't we? That. Oh, can yeah? Can we minister to his back? 
Yeah. Here we go. Okay. He, he, I'll give you background. He I'm fell. So her. He's had a lot of injuries. Oh. And he fell 40 feet onto his head. Ouch. Never went to the doctor. He's kind of like me. Oh. Great <laughs> faith. He, Praise the Lord. Great faith. Him. Okay. Go sideways. He's got, you can see he's got, don't, don't try to sit up. What? He's propping himself. This is his normal. <laughs> okay. He just got a curvature now. Yeah. Mike knows. He's got a curvature. Okay. So we've been praying <laughs> on his back. Does, does he have pain? Ministry. Yes. Yes, yes. constant. Okay. What, what's your name, brother? Chris. Chris, okay. Glad to meet you, Chris. Okay, you have constant pain. Let's start with that. Let's get rid of the pain first, okay? We'll start with that. Yeah. So, okay, lay hands right over the pain so that the healing power will go directly okay. into the directly into the back and and you don't have to uh, and, and and no no stroking no massaging none of that funny stuff okay because <laughs> what we want is just physical contact by which the healing power is transferred so no no funny stuff like you know rubbing and all that business okay here we go okay eyes open look at his back because you're going to issue commands to his back all right everyone here we go in the name of jesus in the name, in the of, name Jesus. of Jesus, I rebuke this pain. I rebuke, I rebuke this, pain. this pain. In Jesus' name. In, in Jesus, Jesus' name. Pinched nerves released now. Pinched, Pinched nerves, nerves released, released now. now. Every disc and vertebra back into place. Every, Every disc, disc and vertebra, and vertebra back, back into in place. place. And stay in place. And stay, stay in, in place. place. All pinched nerves released in Jesus' name. All pinched All nerves, pinched nerves released, released in, in Jesus', Jesus name. name. Be healed. Now be, be healed. healed. In the name of Jesus. In the name, in the of, name Jesus. of Jesus. Jesus heals you. Jesus heals Jesus you. Jesus heals you. And stay healed. And stay healed. Pain don't ever come back. And pain don't, don't ever, ever come, come back. back. Okay, Chris, move it now. Let's move it. Let's see what's going on here. cracking all over the place but i feel good can you hear that you, you feel, feel good he's oh, cracking okay <laughs> i think cracking is okay i'm not sure what it means but but the well, pain but thing. you feel okay right he yes. hasn't been able to yes. he hasn't been able to crack yes i can oh. hardly walk down the stairs to get here and now i feel pretty good now you feel pretty good okay <laughs> praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah Remember. now we can say hallelujah thank you jesus now is the time for the priestly action now is the time we give thanks hallelujah thank you lord hallelujah. okay Amen. So you see how this works, right? It's so simple, right? Okay. Extremely simple. Now, yeah. Um, now sometimes, okay, uh, Joe, what are you going to do if it tries to come back? What are you going to do? I'm going to rebuke it. Yes. And say we already dealt with you and go away. Yeah, don't come back. I rebuke don't you. Right. Amen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's up to you now whether or not this thing comes back. It's up to you. You yes. have the authority. Exactly. And I have to tell you, I really appreciate your ministry because I, I kind of studied under Peter Wagner. Oh, so I'm yeah. like, so I'm kind of filtering things out. So okay. I really appreciate what you're saying. Okay, wonderful. Do, do, all right. So are Tori's we done? Here. Does someone know? Oh, Tori. Hi, hey, Tori. I have a prayer. I, well, I, I have a minister request. Yes. Um, if we, if we can, um, I just got a text from my best friend and she um, her grandparents, uh, well, she texted me and shit. She said, my grandpa is really bad right now. Please pray. Okay. Um, and I don't, I just don't remember what is going on with him specifically. Okay. Um, I think it has to do with the heart. Oh, um, the heart. Okay. Okay. That's fine. We don't know that we don't need to know the details. Okay. okay. Now I am going to. Micah, I'm going to ask you to lead us, okay? Are you ready, brother? I'm ready. You're ready. Okay, you're going to... Oh, what's what's the grandfather's name? Do you know? Gene. Gene. Okay, so Micah, you are going to speak to Gene. It doesn't matter if he's not on Zoom. doesn't matter. Authority is not affected by distance, correct? Mm -hmm. Authority... Yeah. If you, true authority is not affected by distance at <laughs> all, okay? That's how Jesus could heal... The servant right. of the centurion at a distance, right? Because authority mm -hmm. is not affected by distance. So, Micah, I'm going to ask you to lead us. You're going to speak to Gene, 
and rebuke that infirmity, rebuke that heart disease and command him to be totally healed and set free. Can you do that, brother? Sounds great. Okay. Okay, brother. Go ahead. Yeah. Eyes open. Go ahead. Take, take it, brother. Micah, where are you? Micah, what, no. what happened? Oh. <laughs> Micah, come back. <laughs> Micah. Where did he go? Hmm. I, bet he I bet he ran out of battery. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. In that case, I'm going to ask Brother Hoon. Brother Hoon is from, uh, he's near Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Brother Hoon, can you lead us, brother? Yes, yes, definitely. Here um, we go. Right now, in Jesus' name, we in, speak to that in heart Jesus in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Life flow into that heart in Jesus' name. In Jesus' Be name. Be healed right Be healed. now. Be healed, healed in Jesus' um, name. Restore. Heart disease, spirit of infirmity, get out of the body Go. right now. Go in Jesus', in Jesus name. name. Be healed right Be healed. now. In Jesus', Jesus name. name. Jesus' name. Don't come back. And don't, don't come, come back. back in the Jesus, Lord, name. In Jesus name. The Lord heals you. Jesus Com heals you. The Lord heals you. Completely Hallelujah. restored. Completely, completely restored. restored in Jesus, now. Jesus name. Amen. Right now. So, Amen. so Tori, you uh, you talk to him and find out what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we want to hear the testimony. Yeah. Okay. Praise yeah. the Lord. It's uh, it's already nine fifteen. I better close. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet next Thursday, same time, same channel, same station, same Zoom link, okay? So let's all come together again, uh, invite new people. I always welcome new people, especially missionaries who are going to go abroad and to apply this stuff, okay? I am going to, I'm teaching this, especially for missionaries, okay? Uh, uh, typically, I'm not so hard. Typically, I'm a bit softer. <laughs> But since you're all future missionaries, okay, I'm pulling no punches, okay? And we, we have been missionaries before, and we're going oh. back to the field, so we're oh. excited. Where, where were you? We were, we, well, we've done a lot of short term, oh. um, but we were recently in Zambia, so we, we learned firsthand. Some oh, like Zambia. So we're going to go back. Okay, um, yeah. Hoping this summer. Wonderful, Zambia, yeah. I was... Um, I, but I, I, I do a question after you close if, if that's okay but i'll wait till you get everybody oh. settled okay if it's if you think it's a very important question then ask well, it now okay i'll ask it now i i looked you know we're talking about not doing warfare in the heavenlies correct right. mm -hmm. so how do you apply like the spirit of jezebel like in revelations it says you you um put up with jezebel in the church um, how does that apply to spiritual warfare? Are we supposed to be going after those spirits that are okay? Do you know what I'm saying? Now, yeah. I mean, and she's a territorial spirit, correct? Yeah. So okay. Can it also be a personal spirit. Mm -hmm. so can it be operating as a territorial and a personal, or how do you review? How do you view that? The way I would deal with that. You see, uh, to me, spirit of Jezebel is the spirit of idolatry, okay, mm -hmm. which has to do with um, loving the things of this life, okay? Spirit of Jezebel, spirit of idolatry, spirit of the world. And so what I would do is I would preach the gospel, heal the sick, and get people saved out of the world so that they're no longer under the spell of Jezebel. And then she starts to lose her power once more mm -hmm. and more people leave worshiping her and leave idol worship so i would stick to the to the really simple stuff i would get people saved and automatically she has no more power over them mm -hmm. okay so I, 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 I would just stick to that i just needed affirmation yeah so uh, typically when we get people healed and saved and delivered that's when you see a lot of people getting saved and the kingdom of god growing yeah. without having to do the spiritual warfare Okay, uh, it, it's not needed. I, I know that in some instances, okay, uh, after spiritual warfare, they see results. They see results. Uh, I, I believe the results are there. However, the price that you pay might not be worth it. The retaliation, the counterattack can be yeah. heavy. Okay, so you have two approaches. 
I know that from experience. Yes, yeah. I, I learned the hard way myself too as a missionary. So I appreciate what you're teaching yeah. very much so. so. So you have two approaches. Let's say you have the spiritual warfare approach and then you have the, the Luke 9, Luke 10 approach, okay? Now, uh, both of them can show results possibly, but one of them is very biblical and the other one is not. So which one are you going to choose? The biblical one or the one that is not? And then the second question is, uh, when you just follow Luke 9 and Luke 10, Jesus says, nothing by any means will harm you. <laughs> and I can testify to that. I've been to 50 countries and I have preached the gospel and every night I sleep like a baby because I just do what God commands me to do. I stick to the scriptures. I don't go fighting off into the heavens, okay? Right. And so you compare these two approaches, both can bear fruit, but but one of them is scriptural and the other, and, and not only scriptural, but nothing by any means can harm you, okay? When you just follow the scriptures. If you do the spiritual warfare, wow, you're taking a big risk there, okay? Yes. <laughs> That's how I, I would answer that question. I also learned the hard way as a missionary in Indonesia uh, back in the late 70s, okay? I, yeah. So yeah, great. I, I learned the hard way too. So that I really appreciate your teaching. Yeah, really praise the Lord. It. Yeah. So, bless okay. you. <laughs> okay, awesome. thank you all for joining us. I'll, I'll see you in a week, okay? The, the same Zoom link. Did, and, uh, did Jean get healed? Uh, yeah. I, they haven't answered yet. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. You, you let us know by email, okay? Yeah. T Tori, if, if, uh, if anything happens, let us know, okay? Yeah. All right. So, uh, you can stay in touch with me by email if you want. You all have my email, Elijah003 at gmail. Uh, feel free to invite others, potential missionaries. They're most welcome. And tell them this is training for special forces kingdom of God. We're not pussyfooting around. We're not messing around. We want to get the job done. Okay. All right. So let's just pray and we'll close. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord for doing these wonderful things that we have just seen tonight, Lord, confirming your precious word. Your word, Lord, yes, your word is true. Your word is inspired. We believe in your word. And Lord, tonight you have shown us through the miracles that your word is true, Lord. And we are going to apply your word as you send us out to the ends of the earth to proclaim your kingdom. We will obey your commands. We will make disciples. We will fulfill the great commission during these last days, Father. You have properly equipped us through your word to do the works that Jesus did to fulfill John 14, 12. So Lord, now prepare us, especially those among us who are going to be sent to the ends of the earth, Lord. Prepare us through your word, through the Holy Spirit, with what we need to do. And they will be very fruitful, Lord. Not typical missions, Lord, but fruitful missions like in the book of Acts, Lord, during these last days. Thank you, Father, for all of your servants who have gathered together. I ask you to bless them, Lord. Bless them this week with your joy, your peace, your presence. And Lord, much fruit for the kingdom of God, even where they live in their hometowns. Thank you, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Wonderful.